Rescue workers dig through rubble in Zmiv in Ukraine's eastern Kharkiv region after a Russian missile strike killed one and wounded two others. On Monday, Ukrainian authorities reported that at least four people had been killed and dozens injured in overnight Russian strikes. Three people were pulled out from under the rubble by local residents who helped the rescues and policemen. In the end, they got two people out, a man and a woman. Thank God they are alive. A 63-year-old woman was injured, she was crushed. They were unsurvivable injuries. This house is old and has structural elements, wood and clay. It's hard to sort out. Also, a lot of earth flew onto the roof of the building from the rocket. We dug out the injured people from under the rubble. Well, for more on the war, let's speak with uh, Arise Special Correspondent Carl Bostic, who joins us live from Tel Aviv. Carl, good to see you and thanks for your time as always. Well, uh, U.S. Secretary of State Blinken is in the Middle East and uh, Israel is the next stop after Saudi Arabia. What are his goals and uh, has he made any progress so far? Good evening. Well, already we're 100 days. Days, uh, nearly 100 days uh, into the war. It'll be 100 days uh, next week. It's already three months since October 7th, uh, uh, the, the massacre of Israeli residents just across the border in Israel by Hamas militants. Um, already, his stops uh, began with Turkey, followed by Greece, Jordan, um, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, now Israel. Stating as his goes, he wants to prevent the war from spreading. A former NATO official now is saying that uh, the risk of the war spreading uh, throughout the region has gone from 15% to 30%. The past two weeks alone, there have been three assassinations. Uh, then today's killing uh, of a senior Hezbollah commander. Uh, um, last week, it was uh, the uh, killing or assassination of a senior Hamas leader in Beirut, Lebanon. Uh, before that, uh, a senior uh, Hamas leader in uh, Syria and Damascus and, and also in Baghdad, Iraq. So one pri primary goal is to say that these countries have a role to play reducing the tension. He also wants to make sure that Israel minimizes the casualties. We're now at 22,000 killed since um, October 7th, since the war started. That's 1% of Gaza's population. So you can just imagine for you know, Nigeria, for example, 1% would be about 2 million. So that's just incredible. They want to minimize that. Uh, they, they also increase the flow of food aid and humanitarian assistance to Gaza because you have out of a 2.2 million population, 1.9 million, nearly 90% displaced, not getting their food. Half that population facing starvation. They're on the brink of famine. Multiple, multiple accounts of families going without eating at all um, a day with adults uh, basically, uh, you know, giving, uh, not eating a day in order so, so that children can eat. Also, there's the issue of the hostages. There's still more than 100 hostages that uh, are being held. Today, Israeli media now saying that the head of Hamas in Gaza, that's Yahweh Sinwar, they know where he is in Khan Yunus in central Gaza, also know that he's surrounded by hostages, which makes it very difficult in trying to rescue them. That's why the only path out is, is diplomatic, shall we say. And then the real big uh, divide, shall we say, is the day after. What happens to Gaza the day after the war ends? Already, you know, the Israel is saying that even though we're shifting to a th lower intensity, they're predicting the war will last at least six to nine months, if not longer, for the rest of the year in Gaza. And you have to keep in mind that the Israeli government is not united, it's divided. You've got extreme members of the cabinet saying that uh, this is the time for uh, Israel to expel all of Gazan residents. The Arab world does not want that. Egypt is terrified of that. You now have about half the population on the Egypt border in Rafah. Put in a context, um, the Gaza Strip is an eighth the size, is a, a fourth the size of Abuja. Half of that population is now in the south, about a million plus on the border. That's like to say the eighth the size of Abuja. So you really have a humanitarian catastrophe for so many reasons. And then finally, uh, even if uh, the Palestinians do, you know, remain in Gaza, which the U.S. insists, which is why, you know, moderate uh, US Israeli officials saying that. There will be a governing body that's, that's Palestinian, but uh, the U, but Israel must control the security. There's no home to go to. At least half the uh, Gazans have no home to go to. And the rest, their homes are so badly damaged, or there's unexploded ordnance, 
The whole task of rebuilding Gaza is another headache for the Middle East. And part of Blinken's tour is to make sure that countries like the Emirates, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Qatar are part of that rebuilding process. And Carl, before I let you go, and looking at the effort that uh, some of the world leaders like Blinken is now putting into all of this, uh, do, do you have a, a sense of where we headed uh, with the, the war? It doesn't look like it's abating, is it? Well, as I just m mentioned, the Israeli officials are now saying that this is going to be a low intensity phase. What that means is less bombardment, less ground operations. They've already put out uh, some battalions of Israeli soldiers. They may be redeployed uh, in case there's a war on the second front with Lebanon. So we're seeing that. There's a case uh, uh, that will be uh, heard at the International Court of Justice at The Hague uh, uh, at the end of this week regarding charges that South Africa filed uh, on genocide against uh, Israel and Israel is going to defend itself. They're going to push back, and they're saying that in order to look at you know genocide charges, one, it's never been the intention of Israel to carry out genocide. We want Palestinians to stay, but also they want to draw attention to what happened on October seventh, in particular on uh, the systematic uh, accounts of a uh, uh, sexual violence that were carried out Israeli women and continue uh, with captives today uh, that are being held in uh, Gaza today. And what can you tell us about uh, the feelings, the attitudes uh, in Israel towards this war? You're live in Tel Aviv at the moment. Well, it's a big divide. I'll be uh, truthful with you. You know, the more this war gets played out, there are a lot of domestic pressures ranging from the U.S. to here. For the U.S., the longer this war prolongs, you know, we're going into election year for the U.S., and this war is unpopular amongst young voters, young people in the U.S. They're saying that Biden is losing support amongst young voters. Uh, it could put uh, his election uh, at great risk. Uh, similarly, in, uh, in Israel, you have the domestic pressures. Initially, it was the pressures of the families of the hostages. You even had family members visiting Qatar the other day, visiting with the prime minister of Qatar, explaining you know, their dismay after 100, nearly 100 days, still no progress. And he's saying, well, that killing, that assassination uh, in Beirut last week didn't help matters any. So you have pressure from, but now you've got <clears throat> pressures from the families of the soldiers. Now about 170 killed. And really, a, a lot of people are saying that, especially the ones who's, um, who've lost, you know, lives fighting uh, for Israel and Gaza, they're saying, let's finish the job. And, you know, I, I hear people saying that this is part of the cost of war. They're saying that we need to finish the job. The hostages' lives are at risk. And to be honest, even though they're saying that there are more than 130 hostages still being held, many of them women and children, uh, they're, they're also saying that this may have to be the cost of war. But I'll give you one quick Final anecdote, you know, this morning watching the news, uh, they briefly showed newly released photos of some of the women who had been held hostage. And it was four photos of women basically who were beaten up uh, and, and bloodied. And you hate to think, you know, what could have happened. And they, and they were only shown once on TV and then pulled off air. They, these photos being posted by um, uh, Hamas on its Telegram site. And people here in, in uh, Israel are very angry about uh, not enough attention to the accounts of sexual violence. Only now is the UN uh, taking a closer look at that as a possible war crime that should be filed before uh, the International Court of, uh, of Justice. All right, many thanks, Carl Bostic. All right, a special correspondent uh, there live uh, from Tel Aviv.